So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Philippa Jones. Uh, Philippa has um, 20 years experience working in the intensive care sector. <laughs> um, and since 2010, she's been a valued member of the Donut Life SA team. Um, she's got a strong passion for um, teaching and educating clinicians around um, end of life conversations and providing tools uh, for effective communication. Um, and so that's what she's going to be talking about today. So welcome, Phil. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. So, oh. so even though you heard from Kelly, a lot of the organ donation process is about timing, timing of surgery, timing of when things occur. What I really want to focus on is timing of communication. So these are my musings and things that I've learned over 20 plus years working in intensive care at the bedside as a retrieval nurse and as, and as an organ donor coordinator. But I think the things that I'm going to talk to you about are transferable to the bedside. So this isn't just about what is effective communication in donation, it's what can we do at the bedside to make a difference. Oh, am I going to go? Oh, it's not going to go forward. This is going well. <laughs> How beautiful was that? Does that not, you know, make your heart beat? Perfect example of timing. He raises her above his head and everybody's cheering. But we know the amount of work that actually went behind that. We remember the scenes of he dropped her every single time. I think this was singularly probably the most responsible film clip for people having cervical injuries after a drunken night out. Um, and if you would like to YouTube it, oh dear God, there are some really spectacular fails. But what went behind this was preparation, planning and practice. And I think that's the important thing we can take away from today. Is it really the importance of that preparation? About teamwork, who is in your team and making sure that you can effectively communicate with all of them? What kind of planning can go behind? And I, I'm not just talking about planning and when I get to that slide we'll talk about the practicalities, but planning, coming to meetings, doing your readings, looking at your research, how do we improve best practice? And it's not resting in our laurels. Effective communication is a lifelong pursuit and I don't think any of us will attain the expert, but we're going to get better with practice and over time. It's a process and not an event. It's all of these things and not just one interaction and practice makes perfect, sort of. So preparation, and when the donor coordinators first receive a referral, it's about collection and collation. What we're doing is we're listening to the story of that clinician. Of course, we want to know some of the practicalities, what was the admission course, what's their blood group, uh, comorbidities, but what we want to know is, what is that person's belief? What is their registration on the Australian Organ Donor Register? What was their end of life beliefs? Where's the family at? And particularly what we're listening for is clinicians that say to us, oh my God, this family are over it, they've had enough, they're really cross. These are all things that are starting to tell us about what we might be facing when we arrive to speak to the family. It's all really important. So we're listening. Then we start to reflect, well, what does this mean for the family? Where are they at? And we're mindful that every death is traumatic, but we know that there are particular ones that are going to set alarm bells for us. And they are suicide, particular deaths that are violent, ones that are in the media. All of these things are going to influence our families when we sit down with them and start having a conversation. We're listening, then we're starting to analyse. Is this person medically suitable? Will there be a possibility of a positive transplantation outcome from this organ donation? What can I offer when I get there? And these are all really important things for us to assess and for us to work as a team to decide what it is we can do. And then an open discussion. Every single organ donation opportunity needs to have a, a preparation meeting with all of the key team members, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It gives us some context. It allows us to decide who's going to be Johnny and who's going to be Baby and who's going to raise up that organ donation conversation and how we're going to maintain that impetus and how we're going to support our family. Teamwork. Well, who is involved? For an organ donor coordinator, the team consists of many different people. Our patients and our families clearly are vital to us and, and we, we really do feel part of the team. It's the clinicians at the bedside, the intensive care physicians. It's the allied health staff, our spiritual care, our social workers. It's now looking at, it's our theatre staff, it's our emergency department, it's our transport staff, it's our pathology staff, our radiology. 
All of these people make part of our team. And as we move through an organ donor, organ donor 24 hours, I guess, is what they tend to like to say takes from multi-organ donor. We're having lots of different critical conversations. So it's not just about that family, it's now about everybody else and can I get them on board? Because this is identifying what's important to the patient, what's important to the family and making that happen. And I'm the chief communicator in all of that. Patient-centred goals, once, once again, advanced care directives, Australian Organ Donor Register. What are these families and these people telling us about what's important to them? And not what we think we're going to give them, but what is it we can do to work with them so that they can get the best outcome for them, but also to have a positive donation outcome. And then what outcome do we want? I mean, clearly we would like this to proceed and for there to be some transplantation outcomes, but I think it's important for us to once again align ourselves with the wishes of our patients and their families. Getting it right, and it isn't always easy. You know, this is incredibly difficult. Uh, you heard from Kelly in the remote areas, and I can tell you that in, you know, Metropolis, things go wrong. Uh, golf tournaments occur and nobody can fly in. Uh, we have weather problems as well. A South Australia in particular, we don't have a cardiothoracic team. So if we have a multi-organ donor that requires uh, heart and lung for transplantation, we have to wait for someone to fly in to assist us. So each centre and each area has some complexities that we need to work around. So it isn't always easy to get it right. And I think the important thing to remember is we've, we've got one opportunity in death to get it right. There's no encore, there's no second chance for this family. If we give them damage, then they take that damage with them. I think what's important about timing and communication is that we spend the time to genuinely have open conversations about what they want and what we can do for them. There's a balance between early notification and goals of care, and I think this is important. Clearly, the earlier you refer to the organ donation agency, it's much easier for us. We can get a lot of that groundwork done and the logistics done before we start talking to the family. But we want to make sure there's no blurry lines. It's imperative that we understand that the goals of care are no longer active treatment, but they are friend of life. And that's when donation starts to be raised and starts to be thought about. It's really important that we stay ethically aware of what our responsibilities are in a treating team and a donation team. And we work together, but it's really important we all understand what it is our roles and responsibilities are. Providing families with the right amount of time, that's a difficult, and I'll talk a little bit about some studies that I've been reading. But it's also about the preparation for what next. Uh, a lot of times our families appear to be ready to hear the what next. We've provided them with the worst news possible, that their loved one has either died by a brain death or certainly they are going to die and become an organ donor through donation after circulatory death. Many families at that moment in time might want to know, well, what now? What does that mean for us? And I think the important thing in the skill of, of clinicians is to separate that conversation. And it really is a decoupling of the understanding of end of life and allowing them time and their rituals at the bedside, their ability to, to be surrounded by those to support them. And then we can go in and talk to them about what next. That break also allows you to, I guess, amass your team. Who are the most important people that now need to come back in with you and meet the family? And we certainly know through research in Australia that person is one of the donor coordinators or certainly someone that's undertaken the donation family conversation training. They're experts in this field. This is what we do allow us our opportunity to be with that family and give them all of their options. People need to know what they're saying yes and no to. That's not our job to gatekeep. As Kelly said, it doesn't matter if we think we're going to go in there and get a no, and, and I guess that's sometimes a cultural thing, but it, that's not our call. Our call is to provide our families with all of that information. They need to know what they're saying yes or no to. So planning, and I've put down the side the usual suspects, but I think planning is so much more than having your environment and all of your tick boxes and all of your team and the right people and the right information. It's about arming yourself with knowledge. It's about coming to meetings <coughs> such as this. It's about your reading. It's about learning what does best practice look for, not just in my hospital, in my state, in my country. What, it, what, what does it look like internationally? And I've just pulled two studies and the top one um, is from Canada, and it was published last year in 2017. Um, and they talked a lot about the complexities, and I can't exactly remember the quote, but it was, how do we provide our families who are going through a really traumatic time 
uh, who need to understand the uniqueness of their situation, how can we empathically provide them with the information so that they can have an opportunity in a timely manner to make a proactive decision about donation. And it's the complexities that we face here. So it's really interesting and nice to see that our Canadian comrades are finding exactly the same challenges that we have with communication. The second paper, which was uh, only uh, from the UK and was released in 2018, and this one's a really, really interesting uh, study and they've followed up a lot of their donor families to talk about well, what influenced their decision making. And they talked a lot about, and they, they grouped them into themes, past, present and future. And these three things were integral to the donor families. And when we talk about well, what influences people in the past, it's about, did I know their donation registration? Had we talked about it? Um, do we know somebody who needs a transplant? What experience have I been exposed to in my past that with subconsciously impinges upon the decisions I'm making today? Interestingly, the present looks at what current experience, how traumatic is this? I think what I found most important is how are those clinicians, how do I feel they're caring for me and my family? So I think we all need to really appreciate the importance of the care that we provide our patients and families at the bedside is integral. You are influencing subconsciously some of the decisions they're going to be making it makes a huge difference if they feel that they're being listened to and cared about. The future is really about uh, giving context to the donation experience. They saved somebody else's life. Something good came out of something really bad. These two studies are, you know, really beautifully reflect what's currently happening in Australia. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we do as well. But, you know, don't ever stop learning. You know, I think it's so important to, you know, to do readings and to find out what else is happening around there. This was one of the comments from the second study in the UK. So this was a gentleman and his wife went for DCD donation. And they didn't decouple this conversation. They told him about end of life and then raised the opportunity for donation. And he said, no, nah, I thought it was a perfectly sensible thing to do. I saw no problem with it. I think the two things should be integral. And then the second comment is from a daughter. And, you know, and I think this is sometimes how we need to reflect is I do remember thinking that this was happening all too quickly and I think that that was part of that grieving process in that, wait a minute, hang on a second, she's not dead and we're whipping bits out of her. You know, I think it's really important. We've got so many things to learn when we engage with our consumers about how we do. Have we said the right thing? And I think it's important that you can do all of those planning and all of that preparation, but no two families are going to give you the same answer. No two families are going to respond in the same way. It's about dancing on your feet. It's about arming yourself with maybe a little toolbox of phrases or some communication tools that you can bring out in important times so that we can talk openly with them. So the, really the models of decision making are twofold and I think these are really important. We have the reactive model, the grieving, they're disempowered, they're overwhelmed, exhausted and confused and this is influenced by circumstance. These are the things we can help support our families before we even have that donation conversation. Timing, have we addressed these things for this family as best that we can because what we want them to do is make a proactive model decision. Values and principle, what's important? That's what people want to know. What's important to you? What are your beliefs? What have your prior conversations been? How have we set ourselves up? What's your knowledge? And are you in control? And then you have a freedom to choose. So as you can see from all of that, and I think it's really important, I'm not going to read all these, but we genuinely believe that organ donation is a process. It's not an event. It's not the donor coordinator lobbying into the room and asking for donation. This is a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of conversations, a lot of empathy and caring and support and listening to people. Sometimes the donation conversation stops because you need to listen to something else. There's something that's more important to this family at that time and we need to honour that. It is a process. So this is what I was talking about. So every year we do follow up our donor families and we really want to hear from them to tell us how did we do? What could we do better? What are your memories? And, and we're also mindful that a lot of families have no memories and uh, you know, don't even remember what their donor coordinator necessarily looked like despite the fact that it was one of the most pivotal conversations they've ever had. I don't take it personally, but what they do understand and they remember and they tell me is you spoke with such empathy, Philippa. You were so compassionate and that's what we needed at that time. 
you made it easy for us because you explained what it is that we need to have to think about and you gave us that power to make that final decision. But I think what's important is that Australian families also tell you that they say yes to donation because there's an opportunity for something positive to come out of this tragedy and that they would have wanted to help others. Don't forget we're all humans. We all have these humanistic properties which is intrinsically we are nice people. We do want to help other people. We do believe in it. We just sometimes maybe need to give people time to understand that. So how do we define an effective donation conversation? A yes or a no? No. Did the family have the opportunity to receive enough information given in a timely and compassionate manner before finalising that decision? It doesn't matter if it's a yes or a no. Did I support this family to make the best decision for them? And that's what Kelly said, you know, and that's resounding what people say. We were already going to say no, but we really needed you to ask us. We wanted to have that power back. Nobody made that decision for us. You allowed and you supported us and you gave us the time to do that ourselves. And I think that's really important. I'm going to play another video and I must thank our Donate Life Victoria team. They've made some amazing resources uh, for us to sit back and enjoy how uncomfortable it can sometimes be when we have challenging conversations. Uh, this one you will see is a, an example of a bad conversation and, and not because a clinician is bad, but it all unfolds and you'll watch that and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So Susie, Diane and Ian, this is a tragedy that's happened to Dana. I'd like to discuss though the opportunity to talk about organ donation. I don't want you to touch it, I just don't want it cut up. We've had a pretty hard 24 hours and I don't think we need to talk about that. Look, I, I understand this is uh, difficult for challenging situation to be in, but maybe we could explore it a bit. Maybe we could just leave it. Thank you for considering organ donation. I know, right. You would hope that it would never go like that. Having said that, I'm sure each one of us can probably reflect over our clinical career and go, hey, yeah, I reckon I had one of those moments. Um, and we sold it on regardless. Um, there were lots of things in that video that, you know, that we needed to be more attuned to. I know you're giggling. <laughs> um, body language. They weren't ready. You know, she said this really empowering statement. is like, I don't want him cut up. Whoa, red flags. This family are nowhere near ready to talk about donation if that's the image that they have in their head. So I mean, it was just a, you know, a nice example of how sometimes timing, you think you're ready and you've got all your flags lined up and yeah, it's not going to happen. It's time to step away and, and revisit with this family. I've just really got a suite of things. When I talked about having a toolbox or I talked about maybe preparing yourself and some of the things that we're faced with at the bedside, and these are just a couple of questions that very often come up to us from clinicians, um, and, it, and it often happens early. And I think here in SA we need to be mindful because over 60% of our, our residents are actually on the Australian Organ Donor Register. So we have a really high intent and consent rate. So it's highly likely that people are thinking about this and it's something that we need to be mindful of. So if you're at the bedside and, and the family say, well, what happens if he doesn't get better? Can he be an organ donor? And there's a couple of things you can say. And I think the important thing is, is to acknowledge that they've told you some really important pieces of information. Thanks for telling me that. The second point is we're actually still actively treating his life. So it's about that the primacy and, and what they're going to remember from this conversation, which is the important thing. We're going to, you know, we're still doing everything we possibly can. But I'm going to take that piece of information and I'm going to store it so that we know that in the event of us having to have that conversation, we can acknowledge, inform them of what is currently happening and just let them know what we're going to do about it. It's all these things that people need to hear. 
The second part, and this is sometimes what the donor coordinators face with a really late referral. So we come into the hospital and we genuinely have a family that are ready. Someone's told them that the worst news possible, we're going to be extubating. Okay, let's happen. It needs to happen now. So they get really cross and you might see this at the bedside. That's it, I've had enough, come on. There's a couple of things, same thing. Please come and let us know. This is a really important piece of information that we need to know as coordinators, that we need to spend some time with this family. Um, you know, acknowledge their needs. They might need a cup of tea, they might need to go out for a break, but please come and get us. So there's a couple of things we can do. Don't say, oh, I know, right, I know, we can stop it right here. You can say no anytime you like. Give us the opportunity to explore this with the family. And sometimes it is straightforward and sometimes it's more challenging and I think families will remember being given the opportunity to have some time, to have the right information delivered by the right people in an empathic manner. So don't ever stop your learning journey. Continue to be a really active member of the team. S you know, hone your communication skills. Learn as best as you can. And maybe you one day will have a baby and a Johnny moment and you will rise above the lot. And I wish you a great deal of luck. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. That was fantastic. Um, really good reminder that we can never stop learning about communication. Is there any questions? Oh, no, not you, Michael. <laughs> I thought it was going to be Stuart as well, but that's all right. <laughs> So I, look, I thought that was excellent, and, and one, but one of the you know one of the things I think that we we sometimes come up against is um, uh, that uh, our intensive care colleagues uh, aren't prepared for uh, the time it can take to uh, get a, a good donation conversation mm -hmm. completed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was very impressed. I was in in Victoria um, back in the beginning of August and. I was very impressed talking to one of the DSNCs down there about, you know, a case where there were about four approaches to a family mm. over a 48-hour period. Uh, you know, an initial absolutely no way would they, would, would it, was the nation going to be on the cards? And in the end, uh, you know, they, they, the patient it was a multi-organ donor. Mm. And, and I find that often uh, we get, in, in New South Wales, we get calls into the state office saying, you know, we've got a potential donor, um, but, you know, we won't even admit them to ICU unless we can get a consent and yeah. organs accepted within the next 10 minutes. Yeah. How do you, do you have any, I mean, do you have a strategy in, in, you know, in, in, your, in, your, in your teaching and how you approach uh, people to, to how to get over this problem? Do you have a strategy for that one? Oh, God, what a curly question. <laughs> probably, probably not, and I guess um, certainly in SA and I, and I know in other states as well, is the embedding of the donor coordinator in the intensive care units. And so a lot of these critical conversations we know happen during daylight hours, hopefully. Hopefully no one's having end-of-life conversations overnight, sometimes unavoidable. And what we're hoping to do by going to bed state, by being a, you know, a really valued member of the team, that that's run by us. And so that we maybe have a day notice that we can maybe start doing some of that medical suitability. And it's just about, I think sometimes you have to walk the walk and show people that it is a possibility. And you're right, Michael, it's about sharing stories about a four day, no, it's not going to happen. Or maybe, or if you're not, you know, don't get your skates on. It's not to a they're a multi-organ donor and it just proves that communication can overcome most things but I don't have a, a you know I guess a, a one thing fits all it is really time isn't it I mean I've been here since 2009 um, we donate life as well and you know some days I feel that we've made great leaps and other days I feel that I'm right back uh, at the beginning and I don't know if everyone else feels that way but Stuart's really nodding his head a lot as well um, but it's yeah you know it, it's a it's a journey and it's about being you know trying to have conversations and trying to hopefully wait for people to retire am I allowed to say that <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hear that from me <laughs> great thanks so thanks. much Phil